Welcome to the UK OCR Community Podcast, presented by Obstacle Racing Media. Each episode, we'll be talking to race directors, elite runners, weekend warriors, and frankly, anyone else from the UK OCR scene that will talk to us. Here is your host, Alan, aka Muddy Duck. Anywhere in Chicken Town. The bloody scene is bloody sad. The bloody news is bloody bad. Bloody... Greetings, friends, acquaintances, and anyone else who happens to be listening. Welcome to another edition of the UK OCR podcast. How's everyone's weekend been? Oh, you've had a good weekend. It's a bit strange for me because I'm recording this on Saturday morning, so normally I do it all on a Sunday, but Sunday's going to be a super busy day. I've got Ian coming across from Lancashire over into Yorkshire. He's actually coming over to the Swift Dive so we can record the awards, yes. The awards are, are finally going to be out this weekend. You're all going to get to find out who's won, um, who comes second, who comes third and everything else, and we're going to celebrate OCR for a little bit. Yeah, so obviously I'm recording this on a Saturday, so I've got it all done, and Saturday's a busy day as well. We've got a bit of rugby this afternoon, um, England playing again, I like a bit of rugby. Um, try not going to get messy this week, I've got some AF, I've got some Brewdog AF, so we're going to stop on a bit of AF this weekend. Anyway, what have I got this week for you? So, I've got Norman McConaughey from Beach Ballistic. So you don't know Beach Ballistic, right up there in, in Scotland, um, just outside Aberdeen, run on a beach, um, or most of it's run on a beach, run a little bit of it next to a golf course as well, pretty famous golf course up there. You're going to learn all about that, um, but we're going to have a great talk about um, his boy. I'm not going to tell you what it is, you might know, um, but have a listen and I'll jump on afterwards. Norman, thanks for joining me, mate. How are you doing, bud? I'm good, I'm good. I, I don't want to talk OCR first because you have got the most amazing best mate. And I'm going to call him your best mate because if I got somebody called Yogi, it'd be my best mate, Yogi. Yeah. Tell my listeners he's just, about Yogi. He's just, he's just got a little bit of a, he's got a bit of a big beard, no? <laughs> he's got a shaving problem, no? Yeah, big <laughs> Yogi. So my boy Yogi, I don't know if you see the wee picture at the back. I can see him, on. yeah, with sunglasses yeah, on. Um, I'll maybe pull out a quick picture for you guys as well. This is on my phone, but I'll pull up a wee snap of him. Um, this is my boy Yogi. Oh, he's beautiful. So, is, is he a, a Newfoundland? So he's a, he's a Newfoundland, he's a Terranova. Um, so basically what Yogi is, Yogi is uh, he's from Poland. He's one of the only bloodlines in the UK and he's three years old. Uh, he's a, primarily a water rescue dog. I, I, I'm part of... Uh, an organization called SLSGB, which is Life Surf Life Saving Group, which is part of my kit, uh, which we work with like the Coast Guard, All and I, uh, Arnold I, and Fire Brigade, etc. And we do call it and rescue. But he's got a little bit of a special touch to, to him. Uh, I also work with alternative therapy with animals. What that means is I work with people with special needs, uh, autism, support, epilepsy, seizures. So Yogi can identify up to 30 minutes of cardiac and epileptic seizure. He's a bit, a bit of a mobile first aid unit, but he gives the most biggest hugs and cuddles ever. Is he's uh, he's seventy eight kilograms, which is almost about thirteen stone. So he's a big boy. That, that is some size. That's thirteen yeah, stone. That's... He's a monster of a boy. Like he's a big boy. But that, that's more way stunning. than most of people that turn up to do your run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the biggest question I always get from him is, oh, he must eat loads. He must be hard to, no he's the, the, the Newfoundlands are uh, one of the most docile dogs going um, they're, they're part of like the St Bernard sort of breed but Newfoundlands have got web feet so the Canadians the Dutch Norwegians used to use them for fishing lines that's where they used to come from so they used to take the dog out the new uh, your dog out in the boat and he would actually go and pull in the actual fishing lines for you and, and, and hard to reach areas but uh, over the years the Italians uh, primarily more than anywhere else kind of started using Newfoundland's Labradors, Retrievers uh, as lifeguards. So they're part of the Water Rescue Team at Italian Institute of Water Rescue, and that's kind of what the, where, we, where we follow suit. And I'm the only one really up in Scotland that does that sort of thing. But there is a few other groups, but, uh, but it's interesting. It's rewarding. I've got the best picture you sent me as well the other day of, of Yogi uh -huh. jumping out of an helicopter. I mean, that... Oh, yeah, yeah. To see that must be phenomenal. Yeah, he, it's... <sighs> Uh, there's something about it it's like you, you look at it and you go that's my boy I mean he's like he's my boy you know 
and it's like that hairs in the back of the head and it's like he's just when you've got him sitting there he's just a power unit and you just look at him and think you're so proud of him for these reasons you no know, it's like he's he's unique is i mean it's all right watching some of these sounds funny but if you you look at some of these tv programs with uh like even britain's got talent you see the doggy coming on and he's doing little tricks and stuff like that which is all great but in the real world is it practical? No, it's not really practical because the dog, some of these toy dogs would be able to do that. But when you see a dog pulling a body out of the water and actually resuscitate, licking the airways to make sure the airways clean is, uh, from his biocentry, from the blood sugars, from the mouth uh, secretion, and that, that, that's what they do. They keep the airway clear by licking the mouth. Uh, but again, he's so big, he, he can pull your unit uh, into the water or work with you as part of a, on a jet ski in water as a recovery team or pulling a board in or a rib boat, it's, it's a phenomenal. I mean, I mean so that, that's, that's what gives you the buzz when you're working with your best pal, no? He is your best pal. I mean, it's, it's a special bond you create. The total confidence in, uh, that you have between each other, it's that trust, that bond. You know? So that's what makes it special. More so than ever. I mean, everyone knows I've got British bulldogs, you know, and all mine do is sleep Loves all day drool, long. Exactly the same. He'll drool the same. Yeah. Yogi's normally got a bib on and he's got a drool bib. So, I mean, yeah, the love of wee drool. Uh, it's like, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it's, that's the special thing about it. He leaves his signature all over the house. It's like, ah, oh, it's Yogi's so we'll all over the TV. All over. <laughs> so, and, uh, I mean, and, and the funniest thing is as well, you know, he was going to get dressed up in a nice pair of trousers. I was like, oh, it was a drool patch right at the most prominent patch mark. <laughs> There is, isn't there? I, I, I get ready for work and I'm like, I'm having to push him away. I'm saying to both of them, no, don't come near me. I'm going to work, you know. And uh, um, Because he's so big, his head's right on the pouch side and it's like just right next to it. It's like you're leaving the house with this big slug mark on the trail. It's like, it's a dog. Try to try to try and try an excuse. What's that stuff all over your sleeves? Oh, it's a dog. Really? Yeah. You've been sitting in this car car for 20 minutes, I mean... How did you, did you, we know when you got him, did you know you was going to use him as a rescue dog or did that come um, along afterwards? Oh, that's a question. Um, I've always had dogs. We had uh, two English Springer Spaniels before. Uh, totally different breed. They were absolutely nuts. I bumped in, when we were over in Holday, we bumped into the, this group in Italy and I seen these dogs, this big, huge, massive bear coming out of the water. And I was like, what the hell is that thing? I thought... I thought it was actual bear. <laughs> it was massive. <laughs> it just bounded along. And, uh, next minute, the guy was like, yeah, with the Italian Institute of Water Rescue and my name's Fate Show, blah, blah, blah. And I'd just seen these dogs and they were just mes mesmerised. But sadly, in the UK, um, they're overbred. These sort of giant dogs are overbred for like money and you end up having health problems, etc. That's why you obviously see quite a lot of dogs now, like Newfoundlands, maybe bred with a poodle. So it's Newfie Poos, etc. Yeah. Because maybe the female or the bitch, um, maybe he's got slight hip problems, etc. so they can't bear such a big puppy. Yeah. Uh, so, as I said, Yogi's from Poland, but we just recently picked up over Christmas a little girl called Cindy. So we've got oh. Yogi, Cindy, so she's from Belarus. So we that's a, that's a story on its own, uh, because obviously France, during lockdown, they shut the border, so you couldn't get over. So we had to get a letter from the French Bureau to, to actually say it was fit for the welfare of the pup to come over and collect it from France. So so we collected her over Christmas. So she's oh, five and a half, six months old, and she's already 32 kilograms. She's a furball. She's a giant oh. furball. You probably hear her barking in the back. <laughs> so so will we see Yogi and yeah. Cindy? I'll take, Cindy yeah, babies. I'll take it. Yeah, and I'll show it. Yeah, mm, yeah, so maybe in a couple of years' time, there'll be Yogi, Cindy, Boo Boo. That'll be the Jellystone Park. It's like I've got a grooming hut out the back. Uh, it's called the Ranger Station. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but a lot of the older people remember Yogi and Boo Boo and Cindy the cartoons, etc. But the younger people are like, "What's Yogi? Yogi Bear?" So, yeah, he so, looked. Yeah, he loved to um, pinch the picnics, didn't he? Was it the picnic uh, yeah, campers? All the food and stuff. He's yeah. like a cell, no? Likes my food, no? Uh, likes a grub. Yeah, uh, steal. That's a, that's a secret. He'll go and steal the grub, and I'll go and eat it. <laughs> oh wow! Yeah, he's so, good. He's a good boy. So Cindy's becoming one of the like Yogi and becoming one of the autistic dogs yeah, as so well. So she'll, uh, 
you, you obviously need to full, follow some of my social media anyway, which is called Yogi and Cindy Bears anyway. They're on Instagram and Facebook. So if people want to go in and have a wee snoop to see what they're up to, all our stuff is voluntary, so we don't charge people for it. So we tend to go to like care homes, schools, organisations, corporate companies, working with kids with autism, etc., cetera, uh, to, to, to adults with learning disabilities. And, it, and that itself is rewarding. You can appreciate, if you've not seen... And you're elder in a care home or something like you've not seen anything for the last couple of years over COVID, and the next minute you see this 80 kilogram bear <laughs> walking through, just sitting next to you, slumped, and give a wee pat of the head. No, uh, yeah. that, it's rewarding. But we, during lockdown, uh, Yogi actually won the UK Hero Dog of the Year award. I came out with this incentive program. A lot of children were struggling to go back to school pre COVID. Um, so we came up with the idea, let's use Yogi as a tool, as an aid tool. Uh, so, for example, say, for example, your child had a little bit of a problem with maybe bullied or didn't like school be- so before COVID. I come and visit you with Yogi. And obviously, when you see the child sees Yogi, he's like, oh, look at this dog. Great fun. Love it. Because they're quite, they're, let, let's face it, Newfoundlands are quite a rare breed. And, and a lot of children have never seen these sorts of doggies before. That was playing with them, having great fun. So we actually got the child to walk Yogi to school with 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 the child walked Yogi to, into the school. So you can appreciate all the kids are like, wow, everybody becomes his friend. So we worked with the school and outreach centers and we did like small 30 minute internet, uh, like playing like dodgeball with the kids in the play park. And it really, really mm-hmm. worked before everybody, the anxiety was away, that stress of getting back to school and everybody's friends. And it, it, it created a, a very good positive environment uh, and it worked really, really well. And that's what we've been consistently doing. So it, 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 I enjoyed it. And it was a kind of an innovation system. That's amazing. That's, amazing. That, that, that's something I didn't know. And I do follow yeah. Yogi. And, yeah, and that, and it, it's, it's not, when you do follow him, you see some of his stuff. You've maybe seen him with the foam dodgeballs with the kids and playing. That's what he's doing. Interaction work with kids with learning disabilities. You just going to appreciate. Um, the other good thing as well is which I, I came up with the concept was, and we, we, we trialed really well, um, if you can imagine you've got a child that's autistic and he's got a speech impediment problem, it can be quite quite a, a challenge for a, for a parent, especially if you go into like a shopping mall or a play park or, or etc. So even if you've got a dog that's not like Yogi, but he's medium-sized dog, it's say 30 kilograms for mad dogs, etc. going upward, you can practice what's called tethering with the child. There's basically like a paracord attached to the child and the dog. So if the dog has got good recall, if you imagine your child runs off in the park and you don't really notice it, you can recall the dog back because it's tethered to the child. So it's, it, it gives you that freedom uh, and, and it works really, really well. Wow. That's, that's pretty cool, that. I can imagine yeah. my, my dog would drag about 10 little kids around. With <laughs> yeah, because when, when we were down at the beach, obviously at, at Balmedy and various other Aberdeen Beach, we, 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 we did like three sessions with kids with amputees, disabilities, etc., cetera, uh, adults, et cetera, and taking them out in paddleboard and Yogi was pulling about swimming in the water with the paddleboards. And so he's pulling them about the boat, and it's amazing. Uh, we did like Christmas tree. He's got like a buggy, a Christmas cart. It's like a cart. We yeah. did like Christmas tree drop offs, shopping drop offs, and all that working with the super stores. And, and people loved it. It brought that anxiety going into stores now. So Yogi, Yogi doesn't realize social distancing. Is <laughs> this such a thing with Yogi social distancing? It's like my way, and that's it. <laughs> that mask, awesome. What's that? Takes a mask off you, yeah, bro. <laughs> Yeah. He's, he's a character. He just wants to slaver all over you, doesn't he? You know, he's oh, like yeah. typical. Oh, he loves a drill. Yeah. <laughs> he's like us on a Saturday night, no? <laughs> oh, classic. Touching on anxiety and that there. I was yeah, yeah. I was reading an article the other day. I mean, you're quite I guess up on this, trying to move people out from this this yeah. state of anxiety into a, a state yeah. of of well-being and, and moving mm. forward in well-being. Is that one of the reasons why you started the military fitness? Because I've been reading articles about the adrenaline, the endorphins um, released in fitness, true. moving people um, forward. Yeah, so let, let's, let, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll touch back on that. I, I mean, obviously, what I do now is obviously the military fitness training and the beach ballistic and, and the other next little sideline and what I'm doing within my life is obviously my, my service, service dogs, Yogi and Cindy, and, and maybe if we have another one later on. Um, so what we got, it reverts back to is basically mental health, mental ill health. So the thing we've got to look at is mental health, sadly, could be a little bit of a trend. People, everybody is having a bad day. I've got mental health. I'm having a problem. Or it could be my coffee's cold. 
Is that a mental health problem? No, it's just it's how you actually deal with that. The big problem you have is what falls into the category of mental ill health. That's the thing you've got to worry about when it comes into depression, anxiety, stress, all that. So what you do have is something like something like even fitness, keeping fit, fitness clubs from to going out shopping, to go and get simply getting your hair done, or even like yourself, maybe going for a shave. It can improve your quality of health and your lifestyle, and it can be part of that program as as, as a treatment plan of um, of dealing with that mental health issues that you may have. Uh, it's the same as like me coming simply to visit you with Yogi when you're having a bad day and a little bit of mental ill health, et cetera. It can perk your day up, make you, and it can also give you a purpose by simply going out for a walk with the dog. I mean, so it's like you with your doggies, you can sometimes have a bad day, but at the end of the day, your dog, your dogs always give you that purpose of getting up to feed them. So that's the good thing about it. That's not the alternative therapy side or the alternative medicine. So fitness could be part of that alternative medicine. I started military fitness just around tw- just over 20 years ago. So that really wasn't in the equation really then of, of, of the, the mental health thing. It was there, but it was never really known as, as what it is now. So people don't really see that 20 years ago, let's go and keep fit, pump my fitness clubs or go to the gyms back then for mental health reason. You really just went there because you enjoyed it. You enjoyed to social. It was primarily more socialization. A lot of people went to the gym to socialize. Where I think now, if you go to a lot of gyms now, it's not the same as what it used to be. Because I don't know how old yourself, Alan, uh, you are, but I mean, you're. Oh, maybe, maybe I'm better. Better. <laughs> 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 yeah, we're the same age. But if you look at the, what we used to do when you used to go to gyms when we were our, our age, you used to go in with a group of friends, you used to train, there was no iPhones, there was no headphones in. Everything seems to be now in the gyms now is Instagram. It's all about Instagram and trend and bunnies uh, where, where, where before people used to go and train and enjoy that social concept or maybe go out for a few beers and a bit eat afterwards. It's totally changed. It's all about grams of food, weighing this, weighing that. And it's a, a bit of an obsession where I've always had uh, our multi fitness classes uh, got a bit of a reputation. Speaks for itself. It's hardcore. It's it, it's what it is. I've kind of kept it that way for people. I don't care what you are, what race you are, what religion you are, what job you've got, whatever uh, whatever's going on in your life. It's basically you come down to the park, you come and train, and it's your space for an hour. It's a place where you can vent and find other people's, and then just enjoy enjoy keeping fit and, and still keep it socialising. Uh, and that's what we've done for 20 years. We've never really diversified from it. That's why we've never got into online programs. We never changed in because it's something that works. And we've got just over about a thousand odd members up here. So it's quite a lot. So we're on that's every fun. night. So we're pretty busy. I used to do personal training before when I came out of the forces. And being honest, I enjoy the classes more. Um, it's good for me uh, to socialize as well. It's good to meet new people. And again, 20 years, I've met a lot of people over the years. So some of them have come and gone, which, but a lot of them have, a lot of them have even made new relationships, got married, and meet, and and that's that's great, no? It is, isn't it? I mean, like I said, that, that's where the well-being comes in. Twenty years ago, definitely, De- we, definitely, we, we did the fitness twenty years ago because we enjoyed it and got the 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 community side out of it, and that was good for his own mental well-being. You know, and then yeah. now things have moved on. I think you're quite right now. You know, I, I go to gym. I go to gym every day. It's all about, oh, uh, I mean, I used to really enjoy going to the gym uh, years ago. And, and used, yeah, I was probably one of those people that loved going to the gym. I never was into counting calories, et cetera, like that. But, uh, yeah, I, was a, I would like to say I was probably a pretty fit guy. And uh, we are now I go into the gym now and I thought, Jesus, what's going on here? It's like it's all about who's got the best vest from Parai, Mark, and what, what what new leg is I just bought? I mean, it's like you, you join the gym now and you get a free vest, no, and a shaker, no? Uh, and uh, you, you actually get a mobile phone subscription. I mean, yeah. you phone Wi-Fi in the gym, no? It's going on here. I mean, it's like you see the guy, uh, you see the guy and the girl sitting in that machine for about 20 minutes, one set, set up, did one rep, set up their phone for a wee picture, and that's it. I'm like, what the fuck? It's like, I mean, I was like, oh, my, I can't be asked. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're I'm quite right. I'm off and about your cheesy puffs, no? <laughs> no, you are. You're quite right. And I see this oh, when I go to gym. Really? I, I go to gym with my with my mate Jamie um, and Rob, my other mate Rob sometimes goes. But me and Jamie religiously every morning. 
and this morning's a prime example of, of the reason why I go to gym because I turned up at half past five because we always go half five while half mm. six. No, Jamie. Jamie's not there. Quarter, quarter six turns up, you know. I guess my probably, phone out of me. Customer uh, Locker gets uh, my phone out, messaging where I am. At that time, Jamie's probably dogging at that time in the morning. He didn't show up. And I didn't give my gym session 100% because yeah. I don't go just to, tr to train. I go for that, that community feeling, that yeah, social. Yeah. Totally, me and Jamie, I totally and get I was that. twin wag. I mean, um, totally yeah. get that. I mean... Uh, where I think a lot of people back in the old days used to go to the gym to meet people and socialise mm -hmm. and have fun, where now I think people are quite happy to have their headphones in, take a couple of snaps, and it's all about getting a like on, on, their, on their Instagram page. And it's like they get, they're get they desperate for a, I've just bought a new pair of gym leggings. You know what I mean? It's like I just got 10% ambassador code. But, they, but they're, they're so gullible. If you phoned up that, I mean, 10%, they'll be quite happy to throw you 10% every day. I mean, just to sell their products. And they're using you. I mean, uh, it's and it's quite sad where you used to think people used to come in and train and do the old Davina McCall with the good old Lycra's on in the back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, oh uh, that's going back a few years. Oh, one. yeah, yeah, I mean, the old Jamie Lee Curtis and everybody, yeah, with a wee pouch of that going on in the back in the mirror, sweat band on. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sweat bands, on, sweat oh, bands on the wrist and the head. And <laughs> I mean, I'm getting a bit too much less here now. I kind of get a sweat band on, doesn't it, point? I wonder if we'll, you're yeah. talking about sweat bands and that. I wonder if we'll ever get them socks that came back. Do you remember Fame back in the 80s oh, with the, yeah. the, the ruffled good, socks? Yeah. I wonder if they'll ever come back in fashion. I mean, oh. <laughs> I, mean I, I think if you've seen that in the gym now, you'd be like, what's going on here? <laughs> they're, they're suffering from mental health. <laughs> It's good to see more people in the gym, but one thing I have noticed, yeah. me personally in the gym, there's a lot of people coming to the gym to walk on treadmills. Not to run on oh. treadmills, to walk on uh, treadmills. Yeah, I sit on their phone for about half an hour, no, watching a, a whole series of Netflix. No, it's, oh. Yeah, I'm, I just I'm, I'm seeing that a lot. Or a lot the Stairmaster, just standing at Stairmaster, going up and down a couple of... I'm like, well, I just don't get why they just wouldn't just go out for a jog or go for a walk. I mean, it does the same benefit. Well, it's yeah. probably convenience, no? I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I'm seeing people getting off the backsides yeah. and doing something. I just think there's a little bit more to, to doing it on a on a treadmill in a gym. I'd, I'd be saying, yeah. go out and, and yeah, walk, right. go out and do some. If you've got it's to like, work, I've, I've got a friend who, who goes to the, the, every lunchtime, he goes to the gym every lunchtime to actually go on the treadmill. He does run and he does mm. walk, so he does a bit mm. of both. But he has his laptop in front of him because he, he can't stop working, you know. Yeah. He's got to answer emails. So he has his laptop open in the front of him and it's, it's good doing whatever it's doing and he'll be running. And then if an email comes in, it tends to walk and type. And then he yeah, goes back to running. I mean, see, I don't get that. People need to find time for themselves as well, away from work, which is not it's not healthy, you know. Uh, again, you could, you could say COVID has done a good thing, because it has got people out there in a bit more aware there's more to just sitting on the phone or sitting in the house. As you probably seen during the first part of the lockdown, every man and his dog was out walking, buying paddle boards and hot tubs and you name it. They were, <laughs> I mean, oh. uh, there was more people out than there ever was, I mean, which, which, which is good to see. People out in their bike and going out for a walk and enjoying the, the local parks, etc. And that's what you, I remember as a kid. That's what you enjoyed doing. But... Uh, you can slowly see it drifting back in again. People are going back to the to, to the old ways a wee bit. But I think the government should help that about re-educating at schools, all these sorts of things. I just don't think schooling helped much as at all. Um, uh, and that's a bit of my gripe as well. I think people with learning disabilities and kids and stuff, are, they're not getting educated properly on fitness and, get, and activities and what they should be doing. They're taking them away because they're too worried about lawsuits and kids getting bruised legs and shouldn't be doing that and Etc. Uh, and it's like let kids be kids. No, couldn't agree more. I've I've got a fifteen year old son. I mean, and get out there, do it. Just get out I mean, and enjoy you yourself. Look, do you know what I think? When you look at a lot of parents now, when you if you're really honest with yourself, you go to a park and you're like Jesus, like let the kids just splash about in the puddles. No, they're too worried about their getting their new shoes and new trainers dirty or whatever. Instead of a kid just enjoying himself and having fun and and, and I mean uh, some of the good old fashioned sports use climbing trees and stuff. I, uh, I would like to see things like, remember Kirby? Old game Kirby used to throw oh. the ball. 
with the ball. I see, I would love to have all that. I came out with, I said to one of the schools when we went up and visited, I said, why don't we have to build a Kirby cart? Or, and they went, we can't do that because it's just in case a ball flight comes back and hits a kid in the face. And I'm like, really? Why, I mean, that's good oh. for them. <laughs> that like, was- no, it just shows you. And it's like two, I mean, simple things like that doesn't cost money either. No? Simple ball games like that. I mean, and I miss that. Uh, that, that. That was good fun. That's when we were kids, I mean, I mean, my age, I've got, there's a two in it and yeah. there's a five in it. And whichever yeah. way you want to put around them, you'll guess which yeah. one I am. Well, um, I'm, 50, I'm 50, so I'm 51 this year, so it's like... Yeah, so we're, we're round, about the same, round about the same age. But I, I remember the games we used to play when we were kids, you know, we'd play um, British Bulldogs. Oh, you know, murder ball and all that good stuff. Murder yeah, ball, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Pirates, Pirates, the car, and all that. Yeah. Walking plant, Johnny Crew. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and Kirby, Kirby was at the game when uh, if there was only one of your mates turned up and you were there, you got the football out. And yeah, you still play, yeah. Still you played play it for hours. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it, it wasn't a game unless you hot it off the Kirby to hot the boys of car wing men or next year. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, that was that was a good game. I mean, uh, as I said, remember when you used to go to school climbing ropes and all that? Stop all that because of safety. It's shocking. And again, uh, gymnastics and stuff at schools and stuff, touching kids and all that. It's gone too far a wee bit, no? Gone, gone down, you think, gone down, gone, gone down the PC side, the health and safety, just oh, a little bit yeah, too, that, too much? Too, uh, definitely too much PC and a bit too much. Well, look at that discussion they had against, um, I think I've seen something on TV about, um, they were on about midget gems. Remember midget gems? Yeah. The midget, and they were on about, it was an offence against midgets and stuff like that. And they're like, they were on about Snow White and the, the dwarfs and it was uh, against midgets. And I'm like, really? This sort of thing's happened years ago. It's I mean, why change things that was years ago? I mean, yeah, it's about re-educating people at school. And I mean, and again, look at all that um, things about taking all the, the statues down. And I mean, was there a need for it? I think they'd been better off just putting plaques up and, and, and re-educating people and saying this is what actually happened and what was it, and re-educating people instead of just changing what was originally history. Hmm? Yeah, change, that, that, changing history instead of that, educate people, yeah, you know, yeah, and say yeah. it wasn't right, you know, this person... When you, look at, when, you look at, when you look at children now at school, they're not even going to remember half of half of this in history it's like and I mean you're going to probably be eventually looking back and think oh what was a war all about I mean kids will be like in our age oh what was a war I mean yeah. it's sad isn't it really do you think when you're talking about how we've moved on from how we were kids and we played Kirby and all of that lot to now the computer and and the the thing I mean the thing that touched me then when you talked about kids nowadays in parks getting the getting mm-hmm. the shoes mucky and parents telling them not to mm-hmm. When we were kids, we climbed the trees, we got a shoes mucky, yeah. but we never had what I would say expensive trainers. My trainers mm. were usually mm. hand-me-downs, you know, from yeah, next-door like, neighbour or yeah. somewhere else. Where now, as parents... It's all I, the best to kit. Well, even look at the OCR eyes. game. Yeah. Look at the OCR game. Everything's expensive. Dry robes. We used to just have a towel and that was it. And you were lucky if you got a towel. I mean, you've got fancy gowns now and all these zips and stuff and that. It's got dry robe on it. What's all that about? A dry robe? It's a dry robe. It's a must piece of kit. You've got to have a dry robe. I mean, Everyone has dry robes. Yes, yeah, I've got one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. And, uh, yeah, but I've got it for the dogs for the slavers. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, else, uh, you've never been I down need, to the pub in it yet. I need a dry robe because he drools that much and it sprays everywhere. Though. <laughs> See that I walk about with a mark and it looks a bit stupid, though. You think you're yeah, off to something in a park with a mark on? <laughs> You may have got away with that 20 years ago in a mark in the park, but they know. <laughs> you got to have the dry road mates get away with it now. <laughs> I know. Yeah, it's changed. Again, even when you were saying that, is um, back to OCR and you're thinking, okay, uh, how long has it actually been on the go now? Obstacle course racing? Well, well, really mud running when the first first really came out. When you well, go tough, back, guy, what's that? tough Guy was the early one. And I think that tough, was... Tough Guy, yeah. Yeah, so Tough Guy was 90s, I believe. If I remember rightly, it was in the 90s, yeah, okay, early 90s. Yeah. So if you look at that, when that time, it's, it's like back in those years, it, it wasn't so much fashion back in, in the 90s. People were like, oh, yeah, this is the stuff. Let's start rolling about in the mud and let's climb about in frames. And it became... That was kind of people's fun, no? Yeah. And if you look over the years, then the 20s, 20s, 2000, let's say 2010... 
2013, what's this, 2020 now, 22. So we're looking, has has OCR, is it going to change now? Is it, has it got past that rolling about in the mud and the fancy clothes? And, and, uh, is it too fashionable for it now? I don't know. Uh, I think uh, I th- could see maybe OCR coming into that hybrid sort of style, a little bit of CrossFit, sort of a wee bit of, but I think some of the mud might come out of it. I think they still like the technical side, the Ninja Warrior sort of racing. Uh, with trail, I don't think it's going to be so much mud. I think they like the water. They like, they like the shoots. I think the bit, a little bit both. But I, do they like the mud rolling about? Mm, I'm not sure now. I don't know. I, I know what you're saying. I mean, I got into it in, in 2011. So I found yeah. it in 2011, 2012. Um, prior to that, you know, I'd never even heard of anything that was involved in life. You know, I'd, you either got road running or you got cross country. Yeah. I'd not yeah. heard, even heard of it up until then. Mm. Um, and since then, we we saw the boom. We went to 2016, 2017. Mm. We had a massive boom. 350, yeah, right. 300 yeah. races, I think, in one year. Do not think all of a sudden? Do you not think all of a sudden it got really technical? Um, it, well, it that's what it happened, impact. didn't it? Yeah. yeah, it got it got out slightly away from that family sort of orienteering sort of thing, and it became very technical and very serious. Uh, so I think a lot of races kind of went. Well, we can't. There's not a big enough market just for the serious racer to make money on. Uh, and it's how do we keep a happy medium between both? And that's what I was falling back to earlier on when we, we just at the start, when we were speaking about Beach Ballistic. Uh, obviously, Beach Ballistic are up, 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 up in Scotland, so far north, is if we was just to, to rely on the serious racers to come up, it we, we just not, wouldn't be possible to, to launch, launch Beach Ballistic that way because financially it wouldn't be viable. We're quite lucky up here because... Obviously, the oil side of the oil, the oil companies support us, so they actually put in teams. So a lot of them like to run it for fun. But there is the serious OCR runner in there. But um, but as a lot of them do like to run it for fun and, and, and take part. Yeah, obviously, this year we're still doing the 32K, 16K and 8K course. 32K is basically the two laps of our 16K, uh, which is the 16K is part of the series uh, and the, the qualification side. Um, which has obviously got penalties and everything on it. But we are thinking on next year, uh, yeah, we are already planning for next year, because obviously this the first couple of years here, uh, we're, we're kind of re-establishing quite a lot of grinds with, with the sponsors. A lot of the corporate companies are not back yet. Some of the companies are just getting back to work. And a lot of our equipment is donated primarily from offshore. So we have had to re-establish a lot of, lot of, lot of new contact because... Let's face it, some of the employees are not employed anymore. They've been paid off or they've changed job. So it has been quite a lot of work, uh, considering we've got everything in place at the moment. We've got all the equipment. We've bought everything. Uh, the biggest problem we have, is, like any other race organisers, is, is just the marshals and helpers and volunteers. Because So it's not so much building the money. It's, the, it's always, always a, a down, comes down in the days how much people you've got to, to help on that day to make it work. Because there's one... The amount of obstacles you have, and if you've got nobody to ban them, it's how do you stop people from cheating? And that's why we have got sim- we've simplified our system, which we were discussing early on in the week about how, how we run our time and why we came to decisions the way we do it, where we, the way we, we run our race, uh, which I can go in with you and uh, we can discuss whenever you, you, if you, if you fancy it. And that's kind of what we, we, where our biggest burden has been so far was just that waiting point of. Because our race is on a public beach, uh, we have to, one, work with the local authority. So it's not like private ground. So because it's a public beach, during the time of obviously something like August, is quite a busy time in Balmedy because it's summertime for us. So they want to regulate how much people we can have on foot fall in the beach, et cetera, and how many days and all these things for safety. Uh, because one, we can't cordon off a lot of the areas. It has to be an open style course. Because we're not allowed to close the, the, the beach off. As you can appreciate, 16 kilometres along a sandy beach. It's just not going to happen up here. Especially with Trump. Especially with Trump's next door to us. <laughs> because we're on Trump's golf course. Donald Trump's golf course. Trump International. They sponsor us. So we get part of their ground. So, right. Uh, it's a beautiful course up here. It's unique. I mean, while, while we're on, well, let's talk about beaches while we're on it. Because we've talked about it quite a bit. You know, one of the things I like about it is your obstacles are so unique. You know, a couple of things that stand out to me. A rope climb in, in water. That's a business, is it? Uh, yeah. 
people were mind blown by that. They were mind blown. That was right. Our, our one of our this is a secret, okay? So one of our biggest problems we have with beach ballistic is we've got abundance of water, but the problem is the tide line. So you can understand yep. the tide lines and the tide times change. So we thought, how can we utilize a rope without having to move it so it could land in the water? So it's not possible to have a, a scaffolding build. <laughs> so we came out, let's have a crane. <laughs> so we got a track digger. And the breast, obviously, the track digger, with the sand movement, it's got better stability. So obviously, we just every time the tide line moved, we just kept on moving in, so the, crack, the, the digger was there. People loved it. They were like, whoa, such a great backdrop as well, having a digger suspended with a rope. And I think it was one of the biggest rope climbs you could, I've seen because it was so high up. It's about it's, six metres? It looks about five, no, six oh, metres. more than that. Oh, no, no, wow. it's a lot, a lot bigger than that. It must be now close to about nine, ten metres high. Oh, full, wow. full extension, it's massive, so it's pretty high, so it's quite good. It's just because obviously you might see it off the water, but you've yeah. got to remember they've got the depth of the water still to climb as well. So, it's, it's, I mean, um, when you're, you're, you're speaking with the tracks itself on the on the digger, probably uh, you're speaking about two meters high, easy wow. off the ground, so uh, that's subsided into the water, so, so it's wow. good fun. Um, and we use a product. I don't know if you've heard of a, a rope called Dyneema. Dyneema's rope is it's like a hair aid kind of rope. It's yeah. designed for off, it's designed for mooring, offshore mooring. So it's like hair aid, so it's like a grip, and it's very, very strong. Uh, so it's better grip when it gets actually wet. So that's what we kind of use. And we got that from, from our oil company. So, wow. so it's quite good. And plus we've got products called ship fenders. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Ship fenders is the big, big, massive rubber things that go between the boats to stop them buffering. Yeah. So we use these sorts of things. Uh, so we've got, our equipment is donated from offshore companies, so it's all manufactured. The um, other side, which uh, my, well, my wife's got the brains. Uh, I say I've got the brains, but she's got some brains. Though. Uh, we've got an architect company, so she's an architect engineer. So what we actually do is we design an engineer and draw up our own obstacles. So there, and we, that's the good thing about from us, so we can come up with something can, completely unique. And we worked with some of the oil companies that we make, we, we make it. So um, so we, 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 we like to be a little bit different up here. And that's like the, the big orange things with the <clears> tyres <throat> attached to them. Yeah. What, yeah, what are those like, orange things? Because they're like, you're they're like called, are they boys or? They're, they're, they're basically, uh, they're like a giant boy. They're, they're called ship fenders. These are the ones that you maybe see down at dock sides or between boats when they're out harbour and they, they stop them from hitting together. They're just big, massive circular tyre domes. Uh, so they're quite a big piece of equipment. Uh, we have to obviously get get them transported down onto the side of the beach. Then we've got a crane that takes them into place. So it's quite good. Um, the other third thing is uh, other big unique thing was is the natural sand dunes. The sand dunes is a killer. Where uh, that caught some of the big some of the big uh, runners came up and they thought, oh okay, I'll do thirty two k, and they bailed out in the first lap. They underestimated the sand dunes. The sand dunes are quite sapping. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and I think a lot of people who went to the to Spartan World Championships this year in Abu Dhabi said exactly yeah. the same thing. They were yeah. shocked at underneath how the sand. The, the sand makes huge yeah. difference mm. to, to a run. I mean, we're our race is um, I would say our what makes our race so unique compared to any other. We, we don't have one. Our, our, our course is a clean, very clean race. Uh, it's enjoyable. You've got a lot of public spectators just sit and enjoy the beach. The, the views is absolutely stunning. Uh, and the great thing is you can camp overnight. Nobody bothers you and it's absolutely free of charge to camp overnight, take your own barbecue. Uh, and you've got, basically, you could come up and enjoy the whole weekend uh, and make a whole weekend of it. And that's why we've got this year, we've got the race over Saturday and Sunday. So it's good. So people do come up on the Friday, camp over, got a DJ playing, etc. Uh, and, and you can enjoy the weekend. Though. And uh, where we had a lot of people did either the 32k or the 16k on the Saturday and some of them helped to marshal the 8k on, on the Sunday so it was quite good for that but that's where our, our course is like the UK it's a nice clean 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 uh, course so you don't have much mud you've got plenty of sand for, for, for weeks and for months now coming out of your bone <laughs> where did that sand come from? <laughs> you you I mean, you got so much sand there I mean, I mean I've, I've, I've pulled the map up you know I mean Oh, it's plenty of sand. <laughs> plenty of water and plenty of sand. 
<laughs> they're sand dunes for sand dunes, no? If you've seen some of the pictures, if you pull up some of the pictures, you see some of them with the sand dunes trying to get up the sand dunes. Some people just didn't even get up. They just gave up. I was one of them we had when they had a double sandbag carry up. The gym, they just, I think it just destroyed a lot of people. The oh. <laughs> it was a killer. Even I was like, oof, I'm not up for that myself. I was, I was struggling just putting the marker stick to it. <laughs> I'm like, oh, right glad I've got a quad bike. <laughs> how much do you design the course? If not, how much, in, how much influence do you have over the design? So, yeah, I do. We do everything in-house. We designed all the course. We do everything with, from the obstacles to you name it, we do it all. Uh, from all the sponsorship to all the companies uh, to getting people involved um, to obviously the tickets. We, we use, we've got designed our own website, which you've probably been on, Beach Ballistic, mm. which was all designed by us. Uh, we like to have a theme, so it kind of mates in with what we have with Multi Fitness. And that's what has been quite good. A lot of people do obviously train with us, but they want to come to our event as well. Because they, they support us, especially our members. They come to our event because they enjoy it. It gives them a challenge to look forward to themselves. Uh, and it's something we could keep going. It's like we designed our medals, which this year we've got like a bomb theme. So if you do the 32K and the 8K, on the Sunday, it's like a big, complete bomb. It's a bit like a smart metal, but it links together like a bomb. Oh, it's wow. It makes a big bomb. So, uh, beach ballistic bomb. I, I like that when, when you when you do different events and the medals click together. Mm, it I clicks always, together. I always so. like that, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, you've only been going since, was it 2018 was your first event? 2018, uh, we were obviously just testing a market 2018. Um we had a couple of little teething problems in 2018. Uh, the course was just too long for some people, I think. So <laughs> I think we underestimated the distance of one of them. <laughs> I think it was <laughs> I think it was like 20 kilometers instead of <laughs> well the problem <laughs> the problem is is when you're using Google Pedal Mark to mark out the route. When we first did the first year, it was like, oh yeah, that's 18k. But as the crow flies. Up the Jews, down the Jews. I think it was like 20 odd K. The guy's like, hold on, I've done 18 K and I'm still like 20, 20 odd, still got another 5 K to go. No? <laughs> so they're like, whoa, okay. But never mind that. that and we obviously adjusted things, have uh, changed the route. Um, next year after that, we, we obviously had things almost pretty much on the ball. And obviously, just before COVID, we, we, we did our last event. That last uh, 2018, 2019 event, uh, we had it pretty much down to a T then. We find, obviously, we've been going to a lot of events over the years. Uh, I'll, I'll just touch a little bit on what, obviously, some, why, how we came about in our timing and stuff, to, just to clarify with some people um, about how we got about that, our timing and how, how we want to do things. As you know yourself, you've been to so many races over the years, there's always a problem with technical error, computer error. Uh, the problem you've got is if that chip doesn't work, if you went to some of the marker posts and they didn't identify you've been to that obstacle, uh, you, and if, the problem you've got is if you've got some, even, for example, the timing chip company didn't charge the chips up for some reason, there was something going on. And we've all been there and, and my chip didn't register, et cetera. And it can be frustrating for the runner, but it can give a lot of problems to, to the race director. Realistically, mm-hmm. if I came along and, uh, and for some reason my chips didn't work and I was maybe 100 people and 100 people's chips didn't work, I would have to refund 100 people's back or it can be more frustrating or I've lost 100 people that would never come back again and it could ripple through because one X, Y, Z. And especially if you're going to qualify for something like a series or if you're going to do uh, qualify for a Worlds or Euros or even like the, the new, new new league, for example, and it was one of your races that you had to do to be part of the series... And it can be disappointing because one, you've spent money coming up here, uh, and who's f- who who be liable for that? I personally, me, I would think it'd be the race director because it's his responsibility. It's not the racers; it'd be the race. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know what you think about that. I'm in full agreement because we we had this conversation when we was discussing you being part of the UK OCR series, didn't we? Yeah, and we yeah, were saying right. Beach Bliss has come a long way. You know, you've got OCR World Champs qualifiers there. You've got European qualifiers there. You know. You've got an amazing race, and what we was worried about at UK OCR until we spoke to you was, you know, what type of tra- timing mechanisms or what guarantees could you get? And 
you know, we, we all, everyone talks about chip timing. Everyone talks, you know, it's got to be chip yeah, time. It's got to yeah, be chip yeah. timed. And we had this conversation, me and you jumped on a call one late one night, was it a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, and, yeah that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Discussed the time. And your, your timing, it just can't go wrong. There is no other time. There isn't. Thing. There isn't. I mean, so again, I'm, we're not going to. I'm not going to name some races here, but um, I know personally from my club, and we went to a few races throughout throughout UK. There's been some time and chips have not been working. Uh, and there was faults, uh, and I mean, it can, it can be annoying. Uh, it can be pretty frustrating because one, you've all of a sudden you've got a duplicated time with somebody else, and it's like, well, how did that work? Uh, and it's like the chips registered on the wrong name and. And, and various other things, uh, and, and that can be frustrating. So we wanted to try and come out with a system that would work for, on both ways. It does give us a little bit more work, um, but yeah, but we like to think that the people in the racers come up here are have got that guarantee that their time, whatever the time is, that is their actual time, and whatever place they are, that is their actual place, and there's no cheating actually involved. So what we've done is we came out with this idea. So the first, thing, first, first part of what we do is we've got an overhead drone. That overhead drone is designed to go around the course, try and identify any problems, any people trying to cut, any, any, any cut, cut in their course, um, various other things that we can actually check in the drone as well. Um, it's not, not foolproof, but it does help. It's also good for PR as well. You can see people pick up the route as well. Definitely. The other thing we look at is we, we look at um, most of the main obstacles, we've got GoPros. The good thing about the GoPros, they've all got timings on them. So the, the GoPros can identify anybody who's cheating on the obstacle or identify that something, if there was any problems at all, somebody bypassing while well, they passed me, I bet they didn't do that obstacle, they didn't even attempt it. So we can kind of check on that. We also try and brief our marshals as well, as best we can. And this is a hard thing. Uh, as, you, as you know, it's very hard to try and get experienced marshals uh, because, again, sometimes you just need to rely on some bums and seeds and that's it. On, and that's just the way the, the nature of the game is. Uh, anybody says they're a professional uh, marshal, they're not. Uh, every situation is different. You might have experience maybe in some races, but every scenario is different. Every race is different, but it's always good to have them involved. Uh, again, uh, as long as you've got a body there, it can try and calm any situations down is the most important thing and make sure the racers have got an enjoyable experience. The last thing they want to be is leaving there and they've just had a hype of abuse or the racers just had a hype of abuse from a marshal. So we try to brief our marshals to say, right, guys, if there's any problems, don't really confront them that much. Just kind of brief them the rules. If anybody gets a little bit of a rate, just simply take their number down, write it down, give it to us at the end of the race and we'll investigate what, what the problem was. That should also tie in with the actual GoPros. It will tie in with the information that you provide. It will also tie in with the times that they come over the line, etc. Yeah. As for our timing, so obviously we do have compulsory obstacles with either physical penalties uh, on, on the obstacle. Um, everybody will be issued with a band colour at the beginning of the race. This one will identify the, the, the race that you're actually in, whether it's a 32k, 16k or the 8k you're in. You'll also be issued with if you're doing the on the six especially we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the 16k more than the, than anything else because yeah. it's the, mo the most important thing for you guys on the 16k you'll be issued with a with a, a band now this band is to identify completion of the course or non-completion of the course so what that means is so it makes it fair for absolutely everybody so when you start the race you will be given your band at the end of the race you must come back with that band. If that band is not on you, you've lost that band on one of the compulsory obstacles going right around the course. What that means is you've either, either not attempted the obstacle, either they're just bypassed the obstacle and the marshals take the band off you, or you've failed in that obstacle. So, for example, if you, you can have as much tries as you like on that obstacle. So it's not time, it's no time penalties. So because you tend to find that some of these time penalty obstacles, you think. I'm shite at this obstacle. It's going to take me all day. I'll just take the put the, the time penalty yeah. and go. And they beat somebody over the line. And I'll go, hold on. I just completed that tech rig, which takes me X, Y, Z time. But that guy bypassed it and bet me. And that's that's what we found was a problem. So if you lose that band, that means somewhere around the course you failed on an obstacle. So therefore, you'll fall into a non-completion category. 
So we've got two times, non-completion and completion. So if you're the first person that comes over the line and you've still got your black band, you've basically won the race. Yeah. Go by our time. Because our time is manually taken. So our time has got a funnel system. So the first person obviously comes over the line is time's taken. The second person will take your number. So that identifies as your position and time. So if you've got your band on, that means you're the first person that's came over the line. This was your actual time and you're the winner. So it does, even if somebody came in before you with no band on, it doesn't make any difference. You will fall into that non-completion or completion category. So there'll be risks to get a first, second and third with your band. So whether you take 10 days to go around the course and you come back in with your band on, you're the winner because you're the only person that's came in with the band. Yeah. And that's yeah. what makes it fair. So, but you'll still have on the results boards on our website, first, second, third, fourth, going all the way down on, 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 your, on your results boards of your times you come in with, with completion and the times that you come in with non-completion. So if you want to have another attempt next year and you want to fail, pass an obstacle or whatever, your, your timings will still be taken. The other good backup we have on the, on the actual finish line is, again, is another GoPro on the finish line. So that finish of a GoPro has given you the digital time exactly as well. So it's a backup from the manual. So for, for some reason, if the guy falls asleep and he's taking your time, the GoPro has still got it, yeah? Then his, his pacemaker goes up and he has a quick sudden heart attack because Yogi's just licked his balls, no? Because <laughs> 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 so, he's just spotted Yogi and he's just trying to hump the back of his head, no, in the seat, no, and you've lost your time and your place, and etc. The camera still got it, so... And that's the good thing from both. So you've got the backup from both. And that's what we like to make it a bit of a Am I right in saying it's, it's come from the military because you've got your military background yeah. and you've told me that's where it's yeah. come from. But it's so it's also, for years. Yeah. It's also very much like part run in the time that exactly there's someone same. with a stopwatch, someone yeah. taking your exactly position, same. you scan. Same concept. And exactly you know, the same concept. We have thousands of people across the country run part run and it works on weekends it works and we get very few people complain about the results don't we because it's very, manually done it's, it's, yeah. as long as you have that funnel system in play but you've got to remember what happened years ago in the uh, olympics and in, in, in sports uh, stopwatch came over the yeah. line first second third that's your time there was yeah. no i mean uh, there was no errors there there's no problem there's not a problem that all oh, the clock batteries just run out or the digital things just does that make sense there was no com there was because, no uh, the problem, the only good thing about it is uh, with the chip systems, it's basically instant. You can kind of see where you are, but it doesn't tell you if you won that race, if you've cheated. That makes sense. It just tells you what. Yeah. And the other good thing we can have is if we've got any problems or any competitors have got problems, most of the competitive athletes have all got Strava or they've got some sort of mapping system themselves. So therefore, you can just ask to see a copy of their mapping system. Yeah. And then you can see if it's gone around the same route. That's a good thing about it. Uh, I, I, so like how you're doing, I, I like how you're doing the manual side and you're using technology as a backup yeah. rather than the opposite way around. The way around. Yeah. 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 And I like that. It, you know, the, it, takes us, it takes us, well, you've got to remember, as soon as we get all the racers come in after the race is done, uh, we can obviously manually quickly quickly look through, 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 through the list. Then we'll quickly ask, obviously, any of the marshals, if they were cheating, etc., there was any problem. But provisionally, your first, second, and third places are instantly, and you should come over the line because it's, it's done there and then. But um, we have to obviously manually go home that night and go and put these timings back into our, into our website. So it's we don't give it to a third party company. It's all done. So we don't have to phone up somebody else and say, "Can you? Can you? Oh, can you go and do this? Can you do it? Is that a problem? That problem? That problem? This?" It's us. So we've got the full, it's a bit of OCD really, but um, it's us, we're taking full reliability on it. Uh, yeah. So we go and upload all the timings onto our website. So if, when you go on our website, I don't know if you can get access to it, uh, if you're on it there. If you go on our website, you just click on past results. You'll see the way we do things. I'm, I'm on there right now. and yeah. Yeah, So 2019, see. you see it, it's very clear, pretty straightforward, 32K, who came in first? You've also got the timing, and you've got, if you go down, you'll see male, female, all that sort of categories, it's all there. Then you'll see further down, you'll see DNF, which is did not finish. And somebody just did not finish the race. I can I can see this. I mean, 
the things that I'm looking, there's some things I'm checking here. You know, I'm looking at this. We've got the 16K race. This tells me how tough your race is this. Because I'm looking here, first place is 16K Elite Wave. Yep. Yep. One hour 48. Yeah. That you probably recognise some of them as well. Uh, some of them are, are pretty... Uh, Martin Stanford, you probably know some of them. Yeah. They're down the road. Uh, you probably know uh, Andrew Snedden. Andrew Snedden, yeah. Yeah, um, Peter McNaught. I don't know him, no. I don't know that. Yeah. I don't know Peter. Julie Sheeran. Yeah, I don't know if you know any of the, and Some of those other guys as well. Uh, there's, there's quite a few of those guys, quite serious runners. And you can see how long it's taken them. I mean, those are... You know, that tells me it's a pretty tough race. Well, no. your fastest, your fastest female in the sixteen k race was was uh, Kirsty Horn. She was the one that's on the rope climb. She was the one, one, one of the only people that uh, actually managed to do the whole rope climb on the on the digger. She's two hours thirty minutes. So you can see how challenging it is. Wow. I mean, if we go back to twenty eighteen, and yep. people know this name, so people down down here in England. We'll all know Ross Darren Brockley. Darren and all them, yeah, Darren yeah. Tickham. That was when we changed like the end of the race to 32 k. Th- it just shows you three, almost four hours. Yeah, I mean Ross Brackley, one thirty one yeah, for a sixteen k race. Ross, yeah, people know him. He's absolutely, you know, he flies. Um, yeah, and that, and that, that was the, that the two thousand and eighteen, the one that you're on now, was easier than the two thousand and nineteen one. So guys, uh, we didn't I mean, have half the, the, the obstacles. We didn't have the technical rig in the 2018, where the 2019 we had the big technical rig. Uh, wow. Again, I think there was only a few people actually made it across our technical rig. And just due to the fact is the way the course was, it, it, the endurance sapped them. And by the time they got over the tech rig, they were, they were gassed. They had nothing, nothing in the tin. So 2022... What's yeah. new for twenty twenty two? What what's going to happen? What, what haven't you had that you're going to fetch this year? Can you give us some info? We've changed a couple of obstacles. Uh, yeah, we we've changed a little bit of the routes. Uh, we've changed the starting as well. So um, where the maps are all online, uh, which can be seen and would be posted it as well. But uh, the the difference. What we found on two thousand nineteen as one of the starting points, we had a little bit of a congestion on the first obstacles because uh, we were so quickly into it. Um, which this year we've just changed the position of some of the obstacles. Uh, it gives it a little bit more of a run at the beginning, which will space people out a wee bit more. Uh, and we've put, added in a few extra obstacles on the end. So the actual tech, tech rig this year, as a heads up, is actually coming through the finish line instead of halfway through the course. Oh, wow. So it actually, so people will watch you coming over the finish line on the tech rig. So you can't cheat. I, mean, uh, I love, so that's I love some of the names there. you've got. Some of the names you've got. Chomps Wall, like that one. Yeah. Baltic Blitz. Well, that should be Baltic Balls. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, basically, yeah, balls are going to get a wee bit chilly, you know? So, yeah. So we've kept with that military sort of theme, armory sort of concept, and like the watchtower means you're obviously climbing up over a big, big, big... Did you see the one with the big t- container stack? I did, That's, yes, yeah. yeah. The container. The other one was a monkey bar and the rings and all these such things. And uh, uh, yeah, there's like quite a few, few good ones. The other one, did you see the big uh, water slide we made off the sand dune? I did see the water slide. Yeah, I've seen that yeah. on the video. I mean, for anyone who wants to watch this, if you go on to beachballistic.com on yeah, the on page, it's on there as well. Some of it's on there. Good video on there. Did you see the guy with the sandbag walking up the sand dune? <laughs> He's like, he's like basically fuck me. Does this sand you never stop? No, he's like he's like halfway up. He's actually stopped halfway up in the video. He's like, oh, is there anybody else there? <laughs> then he's carried on. I mean, it's, I think I he's mean, actually looks... bare feet. I think he's actually took his shoes off by the looks of things. I think he's actually took his actual shoes off. He's like, uh, it's not winning with his shoes on. No, he's not getting anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite funny. Uh, I think he's given up the ghost, though. <laughs> What's up there in Scotland now? We haven't got many races either, have we? You know, I mean, yeah, no sadly issue. they're disappearing. No, um, well, it looks like there's not going to be any Spartans. Uh, well, 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 basically, Tough Mirror and Spartan are all together now, aren't they? So, um, yeah. I mean, down in Edinburgh was a bit of a disaster, was it? It was a bit of a shame for them, no? Uh, and you think I mean, that was shocking, was it? The 11th, the wasn't the only that was the 11th hour and 59 minutes when they pulled it. Well, let's let's be honest in that while, and I think uh, I think they were pushing their boat a wee bit during COVID yeah. for that, being honest, uh, especially up in Scotland. Uh, I think. To say they didn't have no, I, the, I think they were either too greedy. They were told to keep the numbers down 
And I think they were like, well, let's just try and go with the flow. Mm. Uh, but I don't know. I, I can't really comment on it. I don't know the real ins and outs. So I've never spoken to the race directors. So I don't know. But me personally, I would have just done the right thing and held it off until this year and just says, look, uh, because it's just going to give them a, a bad name for themselves by 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 obviously doing that by people going down there, no camping, quite an expensive course for what it was. Uh, but I, I generally think over the last couple of years, uh, tough winners got a bit lazy. Being truthful, I think uh, they're they're not pulling out the bag as what what they used to. It's, I mean, it's good news <laughs> that McTuff's stayed. McTuff's been bought out by someone else, and they're Who? which one? McTuff. McTuff at um, Knockhill Racetrack. Oh, Alan's place. Are, are they, are, Alex, is he, yeah. Alex, is he not keeping it going? Or is he keeping it going? Uh, it's going, yeah. He's still staying. So I think they've got some more investors. I don't know how big uh, of Alex okay. is stopping him, but they've got more investors. So McTuff's staying this year. Yeah, we were down at, we were McTuff, down at McTuff at, uh, obviously in January for him. Uh, we had some of our guys down and... Uh, yeah, he obviously didn't do timing, but I think his most intention was to try and set something up for next year or, or put yeah. something on. But it was good to see in one of his social media posts that he's he's, he's coming back for 2000 and 2023. So, um, but I think he's trying to do a sprint later on in the year as well, Hank, but I'm not too sure what it is. Yeah, there's a sprint later in the year. I mean, what about the beast race? There used to be the beast race up there. I haven't seen nothing uh, of that recently. Bankery, Bankery Beast Race, um, yeah, they've been promoted quite well. Uh, they do a lot of... Uh, the Bankery Beast Race have kind of kept away from OCR. They've never really got down that OCR route. And I can understand why. They're very heavily orientated by the oil companies of Prime 4 up in Aberdeen, which was originally yeah. what, what they were. They're probably the longest established ones up in this area for, 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 for having an event, which they've kind of came from a trail run sort of idea, slowly went into adding in obstacles and hay bales and water using the Rockburn Lock, and uh, they made that little transition. And they're quite happy to be not too serious, uh, but still be that family-orientated, a lot of charity, because they're run by a charity on Chest Heart and Scott, Heart Scotland. So they kind of do a lot of fundraising, and that's why I think you get a lot of people go there. Um, because they don't have proper, they don't have any disciplines in the obstacles. You don't have to do them. It's a bit fun. So uh, I can't see them ever going down that competitive route because I think they would probably scare off their actual mark. But I could be wrong. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had discussions with them? There used to be two of them. I think there's only one of them now. Yeah, I, I spoke to them about in 2014, I think it was, 2014, 2015. I went up to do one of their events. Uh, okay. um, it's a nice little course. Um, it's not specifically hard, um, but it's it's a fun course. Um, but there's nothing really up here. That's the thing. Uh, and, and you've got and Rat got, Racer pulling out. The Rat Racer, yeah, the Mighty Gear Stalker, then. Yeah, we're anymore. down there. We've got yeah. a, keep, a few of our guys. I think we've got about 25 or 30 of our guys are going down to it. Uh, they just like to party. Uh, they're going down to the party. They're not interested in doing it. I mean, those is party. I think one of our guys is going to do that. And I think they're Spartan as well uh, the next day, I think. Yeah. I believe right. they're Spartan. Yeah. Uh, one of our guys is going down to do the rat race. Then they're going down to do the Spartan the next day, I think. So, <laughs> mad. Absolutely crazy. You know? well, and, and that's I'm going up to Scotland to do the... Um, the Rat Race Edinburgh, and then oh, the following okay. day is yeah, the yeah, Tough yeah. Mudder up there as well. So yeah, I mean, Rat Race yeah. Edinburgh and then Tough yeah. Mudder. So I'm up there for two events in in later on this yeah, year. There's not not really a, well. I, I was looking at some of your list that you had up for Scotland. I'm like, some of them I've never even heard of before. Yeah. But I don't think uh, are the obstacle or is it just trail running or events or there's a lot of trail running, triathlon sort of things and uh, these sorts of endurance events up in Scotland. But there's not a lot of obstacles now. No, I mean the OCR series is just is just pure obstacle races around the yeah. country. We've just got yours up there. We have got Total Warrior in Yorkshire. Oh yeah, yeah, Total um, Yeah. So Total Warrior in Yorkshire's there. Is this um, not there last year as well? Total Warrior in Scotland. No, they haven't been to Scotland, but I have spoke to Charlie at Total Warrior, and they are looking okay. maybe to to go elsewhere. Okay. So you okay. never know in the near future. So, yeah. um. One thing I want to touch on before we go, yeah, this is you have got one of the best designed vests out there, the beach ballistic vest. Like, it's not bad, is it? I want to know how am I going to get my hands on one of these? Oh, 
I can post a couple of down to you. <laughs> and there it is, folks. Uh, Alan's, Alan's got a freebie from the podcast at last. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to that. Yogi, eh? Yogi and Cindy and boo-boos. Oh, amazing, amazing. What a great dog. Put some pictures on um, socials this week, I will, for you about that. But Beach Ballistic, if you've got the idea there, it's going to be part of the UK OCR series, so um, people are going to go up there. Um, or people in Scotland are going to take part. And who knows, I might come down south, and some people from down south might go up there. We might be crossing borders. That's the whole idea behind the UK OCR series, get people to try different races, um, go, and, go and support them. Which reminds me that this weekend is Nuts. Nuts One Lap is the first race in our series. Um, so get down to Nuts uh, and see what see what's happening down there. And then we've got Coming Thick and Fast, April, we've got Rough Runner, I can't remember them all. We've got loads coming up. Total Warrior, Nuclear. You, the best races. The best race, Some of the best races in the country. And we're hoping to add one or two more. We're still in talks about, about it. So uh, maybe one, maybe two. We're not sure yet. We want to give everyone a good selection of events. Um, score the most points. Um, and then give awards away. Next year, you know, the 2022 awards, when we do them in January 2023, we're going to give awards to celebrate our success. OCR needs this needs the support that we're, we're all trying to give with UK OSF, who are really supporting us on, on this. They've put a lot of input into it. They've given us some great directions. And it's brilliant. And it's brilliant. So, yeah. So we've got this week, obviously, with UK OSF series, we've got Uzot, Will, Becky, Mark. They'll be back on Wednesday morning. Also, Wednesday morning, we've got a UK HXR um, podcast as well. If you haven't listened to our UK HXR, which is all about high rocks, hybrid races. Um, yeah, last week we had um, Mark Lewis on, who's a YouTuber as well as an athlete, and he, and he did OCR. Really good recording there with Ian. I enjoyed listening to it. Um, I also wanted to mention another one. I've been listening to Wild Runners this weekend. If you've not listened to Wild Runners podcast, they had a really good interview with James Burton. Uh, absolutely, the discussion was brilliant. Um, really, really, really enjoyed that. Um, I like listening to other people's podcasts. Um, the more podcasts we get, the better OCR is, because we've all got something to listen to on them long runs. Right, boys and girls, I think I'd best be off. Don't forget, oh, another one. Swift Daft this week, that's coming out on Friday. I'm not sure if I'm going to be on it. I'm not sure if I'm going to be on it, because I'm doing XO races in Leeds when, when we record. So Ian's going to have a guest, and I'm hoping to going to jump in live at some point from XO races and let you know how it's going on. Oh, yeah, so that's me this week. Um, hope you have a great weekend. You've had a great weekend. Not have one great week. You've had a great weekend. And I hope you have a great week next week. Yep. Yeah. I hope you're down at Nuts as well next weekend. And if you are and you fancy doing a bit of filming for us, let us know. We'd love some some video footage and we'll put it all together and give you credit for it as well. So, yeah. So, until next time, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Check out Obstacle Racing Media. And thanks for listening. Stay safe and I love you all.